Why do you think some cloud engineers build cloud applications that fail when they get popular? I'll tell you why. That's because they don't understand which AWS cloud architecture to build. In this video, I'm going to discuss five AWS cloud architecture patterns every cloud engineer needs to know. Now, if you're new here, I'm Greg, creator of Thoughtful Techie Cloud, and each week I take you through learning AWS, cloud, and tech to help you on your journey. Now, we're going to dive into the first cloud architecture pattern, which is the three-tier architecture. This is a classic architecture pattern typically seen in web apps. Now, on the first tier, you start off with the web tier. This is also known as a presentation layer. So when you log into an application, that's the visual layer which you're interacting with. You could be clicking on buttons, inputting text and fields, but that's the presentation layer, essentially the UI of what you see. Now, under that tier, we need an app tier which is where the business logic runs. Business logic can run on a number of different services. It's typically some sort of compute layer that runs the business logic on that app tier. Now, on the third level, we have the database tier. As the name would indicate, this is where the data is stored within the data tier. And the three tier architecture it's a pretty good architecture, but you're going to outgrow it at some point. I do like it because things are spread in three different tiers. You can scale that web tier independently from the business logic. You do have the data tier underpinning everything on the bottom. So it's a decent architecture. You know, it's great if you're just starting out. But at some point, depending on what you're trying to build and the business use case that you're trying to solve for, you might outgrow it. Now let's talk about the second architecture, the microservices architecture. The microservices architecture came about to solve a problem. And that problem was known as the monolithic architecture. So I'm kind of throwing in a bonus here because in order for you to understand the benefit of a microservices architecture, you have to understand what a monolithic architecture is. A monolithic architecture is essentially a tightly coupled application that has the web tier, business logic or app tier, and the data tier tightly coupled. I mean, it could sometimes even be on one server or a cluster of servers, which means if any of the teams need to work on something, an underlying issue, like for example, at the business logic or data tier, or even at the web tier, it could potentially take the whole application down and impact it if it were a monolithic application. The microservices application, which I want to highlight here, fixes that. And what it does is it takes things that were tightly coupled and it works to break those out. So instead of you having this big application that does a whole bunch of stuff, microservices is several microservices, each with its own API. And when the different dev teams want to build their features for that application, they can consume other application teams, APIs or microservices. Now, if let's say a small startup team that had, I would say, let's say you had two startup team members, microservices architecture right out of the gate might be kind of difficult. But if that startup were to become very popular, based on the service that you have built, maybe you found product market fit very fast, a microservice architecture would scale quite a bit better than a monolith. There are exceptions to every rule, but that's kind of the general guidelines. So if you wanna scale things out independently, microservices architecture is a pretty darn good way to go. Next up, number three, serverless architecture. So as the name indicates, it's serverless, so we're not running servers? Well, I get this question a lot. There's servers running somewhere, but it's called serverless not because there's nothing running your application code. It's more of a model that just means you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure which is executing that code. For example, uh, if you were gonna use Amazon EC2, which are virtual servers in the cloud, you are responsible for that virtual server. 
from the OS to patching it to maintaining it. What if you need to reboot it or do something? You might need the SSH in it to take care of a few things. That's a whole lot of administrative overhead to manage. When you go serverless, let's take a look at AWS Lambda, for instance. This is where you can execute code on the Lambda function. So in response to some sort of trigger, a Lambda function would run, it would run that code, and that code would process some task for a certain duration of time. And then once that task is complete, that Lambda function would no longer execute. You would be billed for the amount of time that Lambda function runs for. This is very modern application type pattern, but it's not just AWS Lambda. It's anything where you don't really have to worry about the service, for example. There's another service called DynamoDB. It's a NoSQL database. And there are definitely a bunch of servers running up under DynamoDB to be able to present that infrastructure to you, but you don't have to worry about that. You get API endpoints, you create your DynamoDB tables, and you can interact with the APIs without having to worry about underlying infrastructure. Now with serverless, you can string all of those services together, such as Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, or, or even Amazon RDS. Some folks even consider that serverless because yes, there's equipment there, but you can use the serverless version of Amazon RDS, specifically Aurora. So it's not always running 24 seven like a traditional Amazon RDS instance would run. Serverless is not great for every use case. One of the general rules of thumb there is if you are running a workload that is under continuous sustained compute needs, then that means if you are running serverless, you're gonna be triggering serverless AWS Lambda functions a lot. And depending on those number of invocations, that could add up and get quite expensive. So sometimes you need to look at the trade-offs between running the serverless architecture and for example, containers. Next up, number four, event-driven architectures. Now event-driven architectures takes one of the architectures I've already told you about and builds on top of it. So we just talked about service architecture. The event-driven architecture utilizes serverless architecture to make it possible. Now in the event-driven architecture, what you're essentially doing is you have an event, that event triggers something to happen, and then after it triggers something to happen, there's some sort of processing that occurs. So let's say, for example, you have uh, an application where the user would upload a resume, and then once they upload the resume, that resume would be read by AI. After it was read by AI, it would suggest a more optimized resume. It would rewrite the resume and then store it as a brand new PDF on Amazon S3, for example. So I'm just kind of making up a, a trivial architecture on the fly. So user would upload a resume, it would hit Amazon S3, and then a Lambda function could be triggered. That Lambda function could process that resume, so maybe it's extracting the text from it, and then it's gonna send it to Amazon Bedrock, for example. Amazon Bedrock is, it hosts large language models. So essentially you could host, for example, an anthropic Claude, send it a prompt to come back with uh, a more optimized resume, and then the Lambda function could take that and create a PDF of the optimized resume and throw it back over to Amazon S3 again. So this architecture does not have to run 24 by seven. When it loads to S3, that resume, it's stored there. When that Lambda function's running, it's gonna do that processing of that resume and then make those API calls to like an Amazon bedrock. And that only, you only charge for when that AWS Lambda function runs. And then for Amazon Bedrock, you're calling that API. You know, there's some input tokens 
for your prompts and sending the original resume text to it. And then there's the output tokens, which could be the rewritten resume. So that incurs some charges there. And then you store it to Amazon S3. And unless you're having resumes uploaded, there's no uh, compute costs except for the storage costs of persisting those uh, resumes to Amazon S3. So just a notional architecture on the fly there just to help you understand what one possible event-driven architecture could be. The other thing that's cool about the event-driven architecture is it helps you to loosely couple your architecture. Now remember earlier when I was talking about the microservices architecture and how it solves for a tightly coupled uh, application, sometimes called a monolithic architecture? Well, in the event-driven architecture, you would introduce some sort of interim thing like a queue, for example, or even Amazon S3 where you are persisting uh, the resume to S3 and then it would trigger the Lambda function to go do some processing. Even better than that is if you had a request to do something stored in the queue and then you had Lambda functions, which is a compute layer pointing to the queues to figure out, okay, what work needs to happen and then you could just operate that off of the queue. Now the cool thing about having a queue, if your compute layer were to go down, your queue is still gonna have what job needs to be run because it's loosely coupled. If you were to send something directly to an Amazon EC2 instance, for example, with no queue, and there was a hiccup with that Amazon EC2 instance, you would probably have an issue because you don't have any interim queue to store that request and it would probably die with that Amazon EC2 instance. So event-driven architecture is really cool for that given use case. Now the fifth architecture pattern is a multi-account strategy with a landing zone. This is typically reserved for enterprise customers. So for example, if you're just starting out as a startup, going straight to the multi-account architecture with a landing zone, it might be overkill because you are under constraints. You don't have a lot of team members. You need to show product market fit very quickly. And that's a sophisticated architecture that might be biting off more than you can chew based on where the growth is. Now, multi-account architecture with landing zone, you could think about that as a longer term play. If you could execute that right out of the gate, it would be nice in terms of your ability to build long term, but you have to weigh those trade offs out. So who would typically use a multi account landing zone? Enterprise customers. Now, why is that? Enterprise customers are huge. They may have dev teams all over North America. They may have dev teams spread out all over the world. Right. And with the multi-account architecture, with all those different teams, you don't want all those teams just in the same AWS account. So you could separate your production, your lower test and dev and QA environments into their own separate accounts. It's also good because you might have different applications or what we call or what are called workloads that have different compliance requirements different data classification requirements. And so you wouldn't want to lump all of those into the same AWS account. So you want to spread that out. Now the landing zone concept builds on the multi-account strategy. Multi-account is simple. It's more than one AWS account. Could be three, could be 10, could be 20, could be hundreds, depending on how big that enterprise organization would be. Now the landing zone is a framework that ties that multi-account strategy together. One important element of the multi-account strategy on AWS is to leverage AWS organizations. AWS organizations is used by the multi-account strategy and also several AWS services rely on that AWS organization's service to be able to figure out 
what teams should do what and what accounts. And then there's this concept of organizational units within AWS organizations where you can really tighten up the security at the account level, similar to how you would use identity and access management for users and groups. But just think about this, it's not users and groups, it's at the whole account level. So that's pretty cool. So that's one of the patterns that I would recommend for enterprise customers versus like if you're just starting out. Now that you know all five cloud architecture patterns and that bonus one I threw in there, which was the monolithic one, which one would you use? And that's a bit of a trick question because the one you would use really depends on several factors. It depends on the business problem that you're trying to solve. It depends on the size of your team, how many resources, what skill level they have. Uh, you also have to think about when you build your architecture pattern, look at your roadmap. Think about how fast you're going to grow and how fast you could potentially outgrow the cloud architecture pattern that you pick. You also have to consider cost, your security requirements. There's a lot of different conversations that need to be had with your customers. And that is what amazing cloud engineers are able to do. They're able to work with the customers, figure out what the needs are, then work backwards from there to actually build and help your customers deploy those solutions. Now here's my challenge to you. Pick one of these architecture patterns and try to implement a simple version of it. If you want to go for one that's really straightforward, try that three architecture pattern to start. Let me know in the comments which one you try. Make sure you like, share, and definitely subscribe. And before you go, check out these videos right here and I'll see you in the next video.